The U.S. federal government today released the Federal Automated Vehicles Policy Rulebook to lay down rules for the rapidly developing autonomous car market. And joining us to discuss these guidelines is Sam Abu El Samid from Navigant Research. How's it going, Sam? Great as always, Jason and Megan. <laughs> always good. fun to join you guys. Yeah, it's good to get you back. Uh, so first of all, explain a little bit about the, uh, I don't know, I guess the 15-point safety assessment um, at the foundation of this rule book. Yeah, so what, what they uh, released today, uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA, is some uh, basic guidelines, some, some, init some initial rules as a starting point uh, for development and, and deployment of autonomous vehicles. Because right now, under the current um, motor vehicle safety standards, there's nothing specific that says you can or cannot do autonomous vehicles. And uh, because these, this technology is developing so quickly, for the first time ever, um, the regulators and uh, car makers and suppliers are getting together and they're, they're trying to set down some basic guidelines before these cars get out into um, consumer use. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, the basic standards, the 15-point the, the um, safety guidelines that they laid out today cover things like um, collecting data, uh, collecting telemetry data, uh, so, you know, what they want to do is make sure that all of these vehicles collect the kind of uh, data that, you know, you might, for example, get, you know, from an air, airplane black box if there's a crash. You know, so looking for vehicle data about how the vehicle's behaving, how people are using the vehicles. And they want to be able to gather up some of this data. Regulators want to be able to access this data going forward as the vehicles are being developed and as they get into initial use to help, you know, refine the rules as they go along. So it's they're taking a really proactive approach for a change. And I think it's actually a good thing. What they haven't done uh, at this point is they haven't said, you know, that anybody must use any kind of specific technology. So it's being, you know, totally technology agnostic. So if you want to build a system that, like Tesla, that doesn't use any LiDAR sensors, or you want to use LiDAR sensors, or you want to use communications, manufacturers are still free to do it any way they want and innovate. But um, they're trying to get some basic guidelines down. And there's also things like uh, making sure that um, the processes that they use um, to, you know, cover things like cybersecurity and um, validation of the software uh, to make sure that everything is safe. Yeah, so how involved exactly does the federal government hope to be with these cars? I mean, are they really getting into, I mean, you say that they're not outlining necessarily technology that needs to be implemented specifically, but they want to get involved in like the software updates that are pushed out to the vehicles after the fact. They want to get involved into approving the vehicles before they hit the hands of consumers. Is that right? Yeah, but, you know, that's actually no different than the situation today. I mean, before a manufacturer can sell a new vehicle to customers, they have to go through a certification process. You know, they have to do all the testing to verify that the vehicle meets all the crash safety requirements, that it uh, meets all the other uh, motor vehicle safety standards um, for things like brakes and lighting. Uh, and then, you know, th the way it's done today is the manufacturers do all that testing, and then they submit the paperwork to the government uh, for certification. And then the government, uh, you know, they, they will take, they will do an audits and they will take a subset of all the, the new vehicles that come to market and make sure that they'll, they'll run their own tests just to verify that everything was done correctly, but they don't do it with every new car that comes to market. And the, it sounds like, you know, they're basically, they're, they're continuing the same kind of process. It's just that now because you have these systems that are gonna replace the driver, you're, we're adding in that uh, you have to submit some some documentation on how your autonomous system works to verify that it's in fact going to be safe enough for use by regular people on the road. Right. So these are uh, put, these are the rules that have been put forth by the government. Um, do you see anybody pushing back? And what are the particular ways you think that Tesla and Google and others will be pushing back on these rules? Well, I think in general, the, the companies that are based in Silicon Valley are probably going to say, no, we don't want any rules because that's the way they're, that's generally the way they're that, used to work. That's the way we do it here. Exactly. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think from the discussions I've had um, with people at a, a, a number of different companies, most seem to agree that we need at least some baseline regulations as far as some performance standards 
uh, for what systems should be able to detect and, and what sorts of scenarios they should be able to work in. Uh, so, you know, I mean, nobody wants any really heavy handed rules and they don't want any rules that say specifically you have to use this particular set of sensors, you know, but just some, uh, some common sense guidelines. And I think most of the, the car makers and the big suppliers are probably going to end up being in favor of that. They recognize the benefits of that because, you know, one of the things to consider is if we start putting up, putting this technology out on the road, you know, it's not like smartphone apps. You know, if you put an app out there or make a social network that crashes and doesn't work, you know, it's not going to kill anybody. Mm -hmm. But if you put a car out there, an autonomous car out there that crashes, you know, into people or other vehicles, that's a real problem. And so if that starts happening on a regular basis, then consumers aren't going to accept the technology. And there's so many potential benefits from this technology that you don't want to destroy it before it has a chance to take hold uh, or destroy consumer confidence before the technology has a chance to take hold. Um, so I think most people in the industry recognize that we do need at least some, some baseline standards. Um, and I think you know, everybody else will, will fall in line you know, uh, with the possible exception of people like George Hotz, who, you know, who's going off and doing his own thing. But <laughs> he kind of revels in that fact, um, yeah. <laughs> revels in the fact that he's doing things very different. That's kind of he's always done things a little differently. Um, so uh, very recently, I think over the weekend, researchers in China were able to uh, run tests that enabled them to gain access of Tesla car of uh, Tesla's. Uh, to do things like remotely open the sunroof, unlock the doors while the car is stationary, but then also while it's in motion, you know, turn on the wipers, fold the back mirror, open the rear hatch, and even apply brakes all from 12 miles away. So obviously hacking is a consideration. It's definitely a, a, a serious issue going forward when you're, when you're talking about these highly connected uh, vehicles. What kind of provisions are here to address concerns like these uh, specifically? Again, there, you know, there's not anything specific saying that manufacturers have to do specific things. You know, what, they're, what the guidelines say is that you have to factor in cybersecurity. You have to try and make the systems as secure as reasonably possible. And you have to document all your processes and, and all your, your validation processes. Um, so, you know, for a situation like what was demonstrated with the, the Tesla in China, you know, it's not... That scenario isn't a whole lot different from what we saw last year um, with the Jeep hack uh, that was in Wired, or earlier last year um, with a hack with a GM vehicle with OnStar. Mm -hmm. Except in this case, they weren't going through the telematics, the, the cellular data connection. They were going through the car's Wi-Fi connection. Um, and what they did, you know, this time, you know, Tesla has a bug bounty program, like like uh, several other car makers do now, including GM and Fiat Chrysler. So they, they actually used the responsible disclosure program. They, when they discovered the vulnerability, they went to Tesla and gave them an opportunity to fix it. And a software patch was already pushed out to the cars before they went public with this information. So they're, they're just demonstrating that, yeah, you know, there's still more work to be done. And you know, everybody, everybody recognizes this. Um, you know, I was just on a panel uh, the other day with uh, um, the director of the Automotive ISAC, their Information Sharing and Analysis Center, uh, as well as a couple of other executives uh, talking about cybersecurity. And everybody understands that you can never, you can never make a complex system, uh, a complex computer system, completely safe or completely you know, bug-free. Uh, but you, you do everything you reasonably can, and then you have systems in place to be able to respond quickly uh, when problems are found. And that's part of what the, the over-the-air update uh, uh, measures in this in these guidelines are all about as well is to make sure that they have systems in place to handle over the air updates for these vehicles and to be able to validate that the the, the fixes that they're doing are actually going to fix the problems. Mm -hmm. So we all know that cars didn't come with seatbelts. They, uh, you know, we weren't required to wear seatbelts for a long time. Those three-point harnesses that hook in car seats now, those didn't even exist when my teenagers were were babies. So this is, do you think this will be a, a similar, like just a long evolution of safety features being added? Yeah, I think, you know, what we're going to see, you know, the first, the first, autonomous vehicles that you know carry regular passengers around on a, on a regular basis are probably going to start arriving in small numbers around 2020 2021 um, you know in particularly in ride hailing fleets I mean those that's some of the um, 
the announcements we've seen in the last few weeks from Volvo and Uber and GM and from Ford and, and from other manufacturers. Uh, and between now and then, you know, as these cars are developed, we're going to see a, a set, I think we'll, we'll see a set of basic regulations put in place. And over time, as, as we learn how these vehicles behave in the real world, those, those regulations will evolve just the way all the other ones do. You know, the, the crash safety standards, you know, have change every few years as, um, as vehicles become safer. They keep, regulators keep raising the bar uh, to try and make them even more safe, you know, um, improving lighting systems and emission controls and all these other things. So it, it, it'll, it'll be an ongoing process that never ends. Yeah. Never, ever ends. <laughs> Who's going to be the Ralph Nader of autonomous cars? That's what I'm wondering. Hey, Ralph is still around. I mean, True. He could. He, Ralph Nader he, could be the uh, Ralph Nader I, of autonomous cars. Like, he was just invited in, in, um, uh, inducted into the Automotive Hall of Fame a couple of months ago here in Detroit. Uh, and, you know, that came as a shock to a lot of people. Uh, but, you know, while a lot of people in the industry really resented Ralph Nader for a long, long time, especially at GM, because uh, he was, you know, he was their first target with the Corvair in the 1960s. Today, you know, a lot of the people in the industry recognize that because of the work that he and others did, you know, to try and make vehicles safer, you know, they actually the products that they're building today are better. You know, they're they're um, you know everybody we we drive a lot further than we do, you know, than we did in the 1960s. We have a lot more cars on the road, and yet a lot fewer people are dying. I mean, just in the United States. Last year, you know, we we drove 3.1 trillion miles, and you know, out of that, you know, yeah, there were 35,000 fatalities, but you know, that's one a little over one fatality for every hundred million miles of driving. Wow. So, you know, that's that's a, a, about a quarter of what it was in 1970. Well, it's a really great way to kind of understand it, uh, to, you know, kind of visualize it, I suppose. Uh, Sam Abul Samid from uh, Fortune. Well, you write for Fortune, but also Navigant Forbes. Research. Or sorry, Forbes uh, and Navigant Research. Uh, tell people where they can follow you online. Uh, you can find me at NavigantResearch.com. You can find me on Twitter. Just Google my name and you'll find me in all kinds of places. Yes, you will. Right on. Thank you so much for coming on, Sam. Appreciate it. Pleasure as always. All right. Take care. Have a good night.